So somebody's probably told you the story of the saber-toothed tiger and the fight-or-flight response and so on. You know that this is a response we think was designed by nature. So when you walked out of the cave and you ran into a big predator, like a saber-toothed tiger, your part of your nervous system fires off and you get a big shot of adrenaline and your heart beats faster and you, uh, your blood clots faster and your blood pressure goes up and your muscles get supercharged and you're ready to run or uh, you know, run the fastest two miles you've ever run in your life or fight the tiger to death. You know? And then it supercharges you. It's that kind of thing we hear about when the mother moves a car to save a, save a baby. The thing is that this response can go off in response to threats that are not predators, that are not, it can go off in response to stock market movements, economic changes, um, thinking about aging, um, thinking about whether you can meet your responsibilities, all kinds of stuff, and all kinds of stuff that is that unless you know where the off button is on your television or your radio or your computer, that you can just literally pump into your, into your brain, you know, 24-7 if you stay up. All the bad news of every bad thing that has happened around the world to anybody, or if it's a slow news day, what could happen? Okay, you know, like the H1N1 flu, because it's... Not a terribly, doesn't look like a terribly dangerous flu right now, but it could become really dangerous. You know, and that's what's got everybody scared and everybody freaked out and standing like, what could happen? So, and yes, there's a balance between, again, being able to predict the future and take measures to prevent things happening that don't need to happen and freaking out for months about something that probably will never happen. It's a yin-yang kind of relationship. So stress, is the important thing here is that stress is a physical response. It's not stuff that happens to you. It's a physical response that your body has to survive a short-term th stress. And if you survive that short-term stress, like, fight, like the saber-toothed tiger, you know, you've either killed it or you've run away from it and run the, you know, as fast as you can, climb the highest tree that you can. You burned up all these stress chemicals, and when the tiger goes away, you kind of limp back to the cave and breathe a big sigh of relief and tell everybody about how you killed the tiger or ran away from the tiger. And, and your body rested and compensated and recharged itself and replaced all the chemicals that it used during that intense 20 to 30 minute fight. You know, or else the tiger has eaten you and you don't have any more stress, you know, but one way or another, it's all over in about 20 or 30 minutes, <laughs> okay? So there's none of this, like, uh, years, you know, of stress that go on if you're a good worrier, where you wake up in the morning and the first thing on your mind is, oh my God, what's going to happen with this, and we're going to be able to do this, and we're going to be able to meet that, and so on and so forth. And of course, the really good worriers are not only doing it during the daytime, you're up at night, too, because you can't sleep. Right, and so it's taking your, and that takes your resilience away, and it becomes a real, you know, negative, vicious cycle. So, to review, worry is a type of repetitive circular thinking. Anxiety is an uncomfortable feeling of fear or dread. Stress is a physical response that prepares you to meet challenges. And so it's interesting to look at, this is a sort of a somewhat dated model of the brain that's called the triune brain. Um, but, you know, it's good enough for government work. Uh, we can work with this model, okay? This is that there is what's called the cortical brain or the neocortex, the big gray matter, wrinkled, big brain that we're so proud of that allows us to speak and add and calculate and reason and so on and so forth and imagine and do all these things that again as far as we know no other creature on earth does and that is really the most adaptive thing you know has helped us survive and dominate lower down limbic system midbrain okay the basic brain we call it the reptilian brain that's the brain we share with lizards you know and reptiles and amphibians that's the oldest part of the brain that part of the brain basically concerned with survival. It basically sorts things into, you know, two or three categories. You know, can I eat, can I eat this? Can it eat me? 
can they mate with it? That's basically what it's concerned with, okay. It sorts down all the information that you receive into those three things, okay. And, and it acts like that. It acts reflexively and instantaneously, just like if you come across a lizard, you know, on the path, and you make a move towards it, it's gone like that. It doesn't go inside, it doesn't do a Woody Allen thing. You know, well, should I move, should I not move? Would it be better for me to, is this dangerous, is it not dangerous? How dangerous is it? It doesn't do any of it, it's just gone. Okay, there's any indication that there's a threat, it sets off this stress response and it's gone. The thing is, this developed evolutionarily from the bottom up. Okay, this was, this part of the brain developed first. And then as animals developed, the limbic system pretty much developed in mammals. In other, in warm, furry creatures who characteristically have social relationships. And where, and for mammals, for most mammals, not all mammals, social relationships like, pri like prides of lions and packs of wolves and families of people and things like that have adaptive value. We do better when we're connected to groups. We have more strength, we have more problem solving ability, we have emotional support. We are social creatures and our social positions mean a lot to us. And all that emotional processing happens mostly in this limbic system. And then on top of it, the big, smart, intellectual brain. Every layer added new possibilities and new complexity to our ability to understand our world and to navigate our world. And part of the problem when we look at this whole issue is that the new guy is very entranced with himself, okay? The thinking brain thinks that nothing was important before he came along. And I say he kind of deliberately, it could be she too, but it's a, it's a kind of, it's not that there are, you know, that there are tremendously bright and intellectual women, but it's kind of thinking, analysis, logic, um, that kind of thinking, on a yin-yang scale, we typically characterize as a kind of masculine thinking, not that it doesn't belong to women too, whereas the feeling, the intuitive, tends to be a more kind of receptive, softer, has its own logic, but it's not the same as the logic of mathematics and science, okay? So this brain is very good at, especially part of the brain, the part that's suited for, for verbal and and uh, mathematical skills, which typically is in the left hemisphere of the brain. And there's some variation, but that typically is in the left brain, which is called the dominant hemisphere, speech capability, mathematical capability, and so on. Whereas in the right side of the brain, in the same area, lie areas of the brain that have to do with the body image, with emotional recognition of facial expressions, and tone of voice, and those kinds of skills. So they each have their place, you know, I mean, Logical skills have to do with building buildings like this and building MRIs and doing the kind of incredible science that goes on in a university setting like UCSF and looking through electron microscopes and doing chemical analyses. And these are tremendous feats, don't misunderstand me. They're completely useless in a relationship, okay? It doesn't matter how many Nobel Prizes you have, you may not be able to maintain a marriage would be if that's the only kind of intelligence you have, right? And we say, uh, then you may not be able to maintain good relationships with people. Whereas somebody who emotionally, and in terms of social networking and understanding and compassion and empathy, may have a different kind of intelligence as well as an intellectual kind of intelligence. So my point is that these are different kinds of intelligences that are useful in different situations what has happened since the advent of, you know, the age of reason and which is, you know, and the advent of discovering the immense power of our intellectual capabilities, I think has been a devaluing and, a, and an ignoring of the earlier kind of intelligence that has to do with our relations with each other and with other living things and with our environment. And I think that a lot of the crisis we're seeing now is we're trying to come back to that and own those relationships while still maintaining our ability to be technically uh, creative and, and help solve those problems that way. I think that, you know, these have been around a lot longer. This guy's really fascinated with himself and sometimes thinks, you know, he's the only game in town. 
So the reason we used to say, you know, when we were talking about left and right hemisphere, and I don't want to go into it too deeply tonight, but the reason that the left hemisphere is called the dominant hemisphere, can anybody guess? It does dominate. But the main reason that it's called the dominant hemisphere is that it's the one that names things. It's the verbal hemisphere. It's the one that gives people things. So it said, I'm the dominant hemisphere, and you're the subdominant hemisphere. I'm the major hemisphere, you're the minor hemisphere. 